understand. I pray that your word this morning would bring not only understanding but clarity. There is so much uncertainty in our world right now, but we can have clarity. So I pray that you would use your living and active word to transform us, to give us hope and endurance, to grow our faith so that we are living representatives of the living God. In the authority of your name we pray. Amen? All right, let's have a seat. Great. All right, we're in chapter 8 of the book of Hebrews. The verses will be on the screen, but I also put a card in your program jacket in case you don't have your Bible or however that works for you is just fine. So today, we're looking at chapter 8 of Hebrews in As we go through this today, um, we're going to continue to clarify why Jesus' arrival is not only a guaranteed, a guaranteed way for us to experience new birth and a future with God, but it also set into motion a promise. Like, when Jesus came here, He was setting into motion a promise for us. For those that know him. And this 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 promise is eternal and it's complete and it's available to anyone that accepts it. No one is exempt. This is available to anyone that accepts this. So last week we did this deep dive into why Jesus is our high priest like no other. Okay? And, and we looked at, uh, we've looked at him compared to this guy named Melchizedek. And so the writer of Hebrews, he, he's bringing all of this up because the, the Jews that were there at the time, they were coming to know Jesus. And yet, in the midst of them coming to know Jesus and their lives were starting to be transformed, there was this huge amount of persecution that was taking place. Families were being ripped apart. People were being executed. It was not a wonderful time in the life of the church. And yet, God was there in the midst of all of that. But what was happening to these Jewish believers is they were being coerced to go back to their old ways. Go back to following the rabbinic laws. Go back to to earning their salvation with God by doing certain things. And they wanted to move back to where they were before. And so the writer of Hebrews was like, I, I, you have got to understand why Jesus is your only answer. He's your only answer. And so he wrote this letter. And so today the writer of Hebrews is going to further clarify why Jesus is the perfect high priest. And, and, and for a Jewish reader, like, like when they're reading this letter or they're hearing this letter, right, um, they know that, that there, were, there was no priest back then that was perfect. They were flawed like they were. They they weren't perfect. And so when they heard in this letter that Jesus was the perfect high priest, it got their attention. And they were like, what? Perfect? What do you mean perfect? So the writer of Hebrews wants to make it very clear that Jesus is flawless and perfect and able to bring us into God's family. That got their attention. 
And it should get our attention. All right, so we're just going to start in verse 1. And I'm going to read all the way through. You ready? It's on your card, starting in verse 1. Here we go. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. Back then, Jewish people were like, oh yeah, 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 we're going to follow the instructions God gave us and we're going to build it. We're building these places of worship. And now the writer of Hebrews just goes, no, 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 that's different with Jesus. No, no, God built this place of worship. That's where Jesus is. Verse 3, and since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering too. Verse 4, if he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest since there's already, there are already priests who offer gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build a tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. And so they followed this thing exactly how big it was supposed to be, how thick the curtain was, where they were supposed to put, where they were supposed to put on it, paint it, connect it, all of it. Very, very precise instructions, right? So they built this tabernacle. We would probably call it a church building, okay? Only it was a tent, but that's what they built, okay? That's what they did. But then he gets to verse 6. But now... Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a, listen to this, a far better covenant with God based on better promises. Now, what in the world is a covenant with God? Because it says it's far better. What is this thing called a new covenant? We're going to get there. Verse 7, if the first covenant had been flawless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. Makes sense. Verse 8, but when God found fault with the people, he said, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. Okay, so he's saying there's going to be a new covenant. This one's flawed. There will be a new one. Verse 9. This covenant will not be like the one made I made with um, their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them says the Lord. Okay? They weren't following what they were supposed to do. They just did, you know, they were like, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go this way. And God's like, okay. Okay. Oh, by the other, oh, here's the other thing. Here's the thing. Um, By the way, God doesn't force anything on you. Do you know that? He He doesn't force you to follow him. Do you get that? He doesn't do that. No, no, no. He waits until you get to the point where you say, ah, you know what? I need a savior. I I need a savior. God, I need you. That's kind of how he works, okay? All right, verse 10. But this is the new covenant I will make with the Lord of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, this is huge because this language right here in verse 10, this is relationship language. That's what this is, okay? This isn't rules-based language. This is relationship. It's, 
it, there's this eternal motivation and power instead of a list. Okay? It's, it, it's a close relationship, not distant fear. Like when I was growing up, okay, the faith community that I was part of when I was growing up, it was totally fear-based. Right? Maybe some of you have experienced that. Right? In some kind of context where you're like, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm just, God's just waiting for me to screw up. He's just waiting. He's waiting for me to get to that point where I just mess up. Right? And so there's this fear about that. Man, I hope I don't mess up too much. Right? But that's not what this language is. This is relationship-based. It's not fear-based. Okay? He, and so God was saying, there's going to be this new covenant. That's what it's going to be like. Okay? Relationship-based. Verse 11. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. That verse right there is, is, is connecting security and certainty. Security and certainty. Like, in this language right here that's being used right here, this is like, this is a secure type of language like you can have security you can have confidence that when you put your faith in Jesus right your relationship with God is secure you don't need to doubt it it is secure and there is a certainty about it you can expect it okay verse 12 and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Okay? This was huge. Especially as a Jewish person back in the day of Moses and even these Jews that were reading, you know, hearing this letter being read out loud. This was huge for them because that wasn't what they were used to. That, that was foreign. Because this is, this is forgiveness and mercy instead of failure and condemnation. That's what they were used to. That was the weight, like this huge, huge weight of failure and condemnation. That's what they were used to. And he says, no, 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 this is different. This is going to be different. And then verse 13. This is where people can get messed up. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. Okay? The old covenant's obsolete. The new one's here. Okay? So, in this whole passage, there are like these four reasons that the writer of Hebrews is giving why, why Jesus is not only like this, this bridge, the, the only one to bridge the gap between God and humanity, right? He's, he's like the only one that can bridge that gap, okay? There's not, nobody else could do that. Just Jesus, okay? Four reasons, okay? First one. First one is that Jesus is perfect, Unlike the other priests before, who were flawed, Jesus never sinned. He never sinned. He didn't need to ask for forgiveness for himself. That wasn't part of the equation. Okay? Which makes him the best person to connect us to God, is Jesus. Okay? Two. Jesus is in heaven. The writer makes it very clear, like, instead of serving the temple, a temple built by people, Jesus serves the true temple, right? Which is in heaven where God is. Like, like he's given us this picture. This is different. This means that he's always close to God. Like, Jesus is always close to God, and he can represent you perfectly 
to God. Nothing is in the way. Like when I was growing up, you had to go into this booth, this confessional booth thing, to go into this thing and tell another person who was going to connect to God for you, your sins. Like you had to go into this box and you had to do that so that he could connect to God for you. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, "Mm, no, 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 this is new. In fact, Jesus is going to connect for you to God. And he's not only going to do it, but he's going to do it perfectly. Perfectly for you. Three, Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. See, see the Jews hearing this, they knew about sacrifices. They did it all the time. They had to do it all the time. They, they didn't follow these rules. There were 613 rules, by the way. You know what? And if they didn't follow rules, then they had to go to the priest, and he had to get a bird or a cow or a whatever, you know, to, to do the sacrifice or whatever, to make up for whatever. They were used to sacrifices, right, of those things. But this is different. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. Ultimate. He gave himself as a perfect sacrifice when he died on the cross. Perfect. This was a one-time sacrifice to cover all the sins forever. There's no need for more sacrifices. And as we talked, like, um, a few weeks earlier or whatever, we always try to come up with more things to sacrifice, don't we? We just do. We just think, oh, that's not enough. I better sacrifice, sacrifice. You know, it's like, no, that's not the way it is. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. Number four, Jesus brings us closer to God. Jesus brings us closer to God. Because Jesus is perfect and he made the ultimate sacrifice. He created this new way for us to be close to God. We don't need all of those old rules and rituals anymore to be close to God because Jesus bridged the gap so we can have direct relationship with God. Jesus did that. So the writer of Hebrews, he's trying to make this as clear as he can for these people that are like, oh, I think I need to go back to this old way because I was comfortable there and I knew that way. And, they were, and he was worried. They, they just weren't sure. They weren't sure. So as I was thinking and praying through this, I wanted to paint such a vivid picture for you. Why at the end of chapter 8, he writes this. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. Okay, so I've read lots of commentaries. I've read books of people that unpack this. Okay? There's a lot of thoughts on what the writer means about this. Okay? Oh, and by the way, there's also historical documentation um, that in 70 A.D., Uh, the old covenant based on sacrifices would literally disappear in a dramatic way. In a violent manner when a Roman army destroyed the temple and put an end to its sacrifices during this Jewish revolt in 70 AD. It stopped. Stopped. Okay. So as I thought about Jesus bridging the gap, and replacing an, the old covenant with the new one, I came up with this imagery of a bridge. Okay, so, and I'm calling this the tale of two bridges. Tale of two bridges. Okay? Let's go to the first pic up there, picture up there. Okay? So, just imagine this peaceful village, Right? And it's nestled between these two great mountains. And on one side is 
this village called the village of tradition. That's the village where he lived, right? And then to the west, let's go to that next picture up there. To the west is this picture of Mount Eternity. Okay? And so between these two mountains, there's this river, this raging river that the, the villagers, they needed to cross this in order to get to the other side. Okay? And for generations, for generations, they used this bridge. For generations. This bridge of rules. All right? But there was a problem. Let's go to that next one, Peter. Okay? It was built long, long ago by their ancestors. Long time ago. Under the guidance of some very wise elders. But the bridge was hard to navigate. Like it was really hard to get from one side to the next. And it had these planks, you know, that they were constantly breaking and, and rotting away and, and missing a step would be extremely dangerous if you missed the step. And so the elders taught the villagers these precise instructions on how to cross safely. This is what you need to do to cross safely. But, but even the smallest misstep, according to that they did, you had to start over. Like if you had a misstep on here, and let's say you got all the way up here, and you had some kind of misstep or something, whatever, you had to come all the way back and go up there again. That was just what they did. Okay? And despite their best efforts, the villagers, they struggled and they felt burdened by these strict requirements. And for generations, they watched the bridge continue to deteriorate, fearing what's going to happen when the bridge actually disappears. Right? Right? And their efforts almost became unbearable. But then one day, one day a master builder came. Nicknamed the Messiah. He arrived in the village. Seeing all the struggles that the people had, he decided, I'm going to construct a new bridge. Let's go to that next one, Peter. This bridge is called the Bridge of Grace. And it was strong and it was straight. It was made of unbreakable material. And all you had to do is trust, trust in the strength and the reliability to pass. That's all you had to do. And so, Emmanuel, the master builder, he invited all the villagers to use this new bridge. And he assured them it would lead them to safety on the other side without any issue of falling or navigating or all these requirements on the old bridge. He goes, this is better. But let's go to the next one there, Peter. Some of the villagers were hesitant because they knew this other bridge. They were familiar with this other bridge. This was like, I think I, I know it's kind of dangerous, or whatever, but I, I, I know where to step. I know how to get there, but some of them were like, oh, I'm not sure. And let's go to the next one, Peter. The others embraced that bridge of grace, finding joy and relief. It was simple. It gave them the strength 
every day that they needed. And then something happened, like over time, it became really clear that the old bridge was deteriorating. And its planks were rotting. And it could no longer provide a safe passage. And the villagers realized that the old bridge served its purpose. It had served its purpose for many years in the past, but now a better way was being provided. So people in the village, they were talking and they were wondering and people had different comments about this. And so Emmanuel, he sat them down and he explained something to them. He said, the old bridge was a shadow of what was to come. It taught you discipline and the importance of following guidance. But now, I'm going to offer you a new way that fulfills the purpose of the old bridge and brings you closer to those fields of abundance that you're wanting to cross over for you to have a part of. And so the villagers, they understood this, right? And they embraced this new bridge fully. The bridge of rules became a relic of the past, a reminder of where they came from, but was no longer necessary for them to get to their destination, right? The bridge of grace made the old bridge obsolete because it offered something superior, better, and more accessible for you to reach your destination. Okay? So, let me explain this connected to what we just read in chapter 8. All right? Let's go to the next one up there, Peter. Okay, so this bridge of rules, bridge of rules, it represented the old covenant, the strict laws and rituals that were difficult to follow perfectly. And as a Jewish person, back then, you would become exhausted at trying to follow all of these rules. Every day you had to cross the same treacherous bridge not knowing if you're going to slip and fall and what happens if I do? I don't want to go back and start over. That was their life. They didn't want to do that. But the bridge of grace, let's go to the next one there, Peter. That symbolizes the new covenant through Jesus offering a direct and simpler path to a relationship with God. The master builder Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us, Jesus brought a new covenant. New covenant. The deterioration of the old bridge illustrates, okay, listen, how the old covenant became outdated and it was insufficient over time. It had its day. Okay, it had its day. The old covenant is considered obsolete because it, it pointed toward the need for a better way. It was a need for a better way, right? And the new covenant, listen to this. Now I want you to get this. The new covenant does not discard the values of the old. Listen to me. Can you still read, like in the Old Testament, can you still gather good theological truth about who God is in the Old Testament? Absolutely. 
God never changes. Right? We need those things, right? And so it, it, it doesn't discard the va- values, but it fulfills and surpasses them. It fulfills and surpasses them by providing a more perfect path to our connection and our reconciliation, which, like this new bridge, and this, this, this new bridge made the old one unnecessary. And you can choose which bridge you want to use. Because God doesn't force you. You can choose. That's why the writer of Hebrews, as he's writing this, trying to get these Jewish believers to understand why you can have faith and your hope can be strong and you can have endurance because of Jesus and Jesus alone. Period. That's why. That's why. Because we have clarity in who Jesus is. He just wanted to make it clear. And I hope as we're going through this, as we're going through this, every time when we talk and we come back to this, you get more and more clarity on why Jesus is enough. He's enough. And you understand why he came And he's our guarantee of a life with God in heaven. He is enough. My prayer is, is that as we live our lives, as we go through, like even this this week, as we go through this week, we're going to be presented with both bridges. We just are. And we're already going to consider the old bridge that we're going to struggle and you know, hope we don't misstep and all of those things. Or we're going to choose this new bridge through Jesus, this bridge of grace where you're going to live your life fully expecting God to move in and through and your, your life and that he's got you. No matter what it is, what your destination is, I don't know where the bridge is headed. Jesus does. He knows, like, Whatever it is in your life that you have, that you're, that you're facing, we can use one of those two bridges in order to reach that destiny, whatever it is. And Jesus is helping us understand the ultimate place where that bridge lies is this place with God. This eternity with God. And it's a bridge of grace. All right, let's... Let's stand, let's sing this last song together, and then I'm going to close this, okay? Here we go.